Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 2060. Be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Today I'm in Muscle Shows, Alabama. Very cool name with a special guest by the name of Chris Smith. Chris, welcome to Cars Yeah. Do you have it in gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mark, very much for having me on. You're welcome. We're going to have some fun. This is going to be a very interesting show because we're going to be talking about raw materials that go into making of our automobiles and all sorts of products and so forth. But before I give you a proper introduction and we talk about your business, what's one little thing, Chris, that most people don't know about you? Um, I would say probably the fact that before I got a real job in the aluminum industry, I was actually a professional soccer player. Really? Well, I think you're the second or third I've had on this show. How long did you play soccer for? Actually, when I was 16, I signed my first uh, professional contract. And uh, before I was advised by my parents to get a real job, I did that for about a year. For about a year. And then unfortunately, I had a knee injury, which, uh, which ended that. So it was a good job that I had a plan B. Uh, well, definitely. Absolutely. Well, that's fascinating. Very cool. Soccer is a wonderful sport. And uh, yes, it is. yeah, the young age of 16, that's incredible. Do they typically start professional soccer players that young? Yeah, you can actually sign uh, schoolboy forms, as they are called, when you're uh, for, from 14 to 16. And then your first apprentice contract is typically 16 to 18. And then uh, full time uh, contracts from there. Uh, that's roughly the, the timeline and the age, age groups that they would target for those different stages. Wow, amazing. Very cool. Well, let me give you a proper introduction. We're going to dive into what you're doing today, which is quite different than playing soccer on the field. That's for sure. Just a little bit. <laughs> yes. yes. Chris Smith is the president of Constellium, where they produce aluminum rolled products for the automotive and packaging industries. In his role, he leads a team of more than 1,300 employees and is responsible for EHS, operations, maintenance, and reliability, supply chain, quality, procurement, finance, and human resources. You have your hands full, my friend. With more than 35 <laughs> years of experience in the aluminum and automotive industries, Chris brings expertise in R&D, material, quality, technical, customer service, account management, and operations management. Prior to joining Constellium, he was the president of a rolling company in Saudi Arabia for two years. My father worked there for a few years. That's an interesting experience. Yes, it is. During his career, he also held various positions of increasing responsibility with Novellus in the UK, Germany, and the United States. We'll be back in just a moment, but first a word from our sponsors. So give them a little love and we'll be right back. My friends at Covercraft offer you 10 different options. That's right, 10 for your vehicle's protection. You can choose from WeatherShield HP, HD, Sunbrella, Ultratect, Reflect, Form Fit, Custom View Shield and their newest five layer all climate cover, three layer moderate climate cover, and a five layer indoor option. You have all sorts of ways to protect your car. All of these are custom tailored by Covercraft's talented craftspeople. It's the form and fit with the quality to attention to detail that's been their standard since 1965. Surface protection is the best way to preserve the investment you've made in your vehicles. It's what I do. Covercraft protects cars, trucks, motorcycles, RVs, trailers, and watercraft too. I have a Covercraft cover for every one of my vehicles, and I've got a deal for you. If you use the code YEAH21, Y-E-A-H-21, at Covercraft.com, they'll give you 10% off your order, plus you get free shipping. That's right, 10% off and free shipping. Just use the code YEAH21 at checkout. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. I was talking with a buddy of mine the other day, and he asked me about American Collectors Insurance. He said, while I listen to you on Cars Yeah, you're always talking about agreed value collector car insurance. Well, I insure all my cars on my regular auto insurance policy, and I've done it for years. Why use a different company for my collector cars? I get a multi-car discount. Isn't that good enough? I suggested he call his carrier and ask how much he would get if his collector car was totaled 
are stolen. He called back and said, boy, that was a scary conversation. Their value of my car wasn't even close to what it's really worth. Thank you for the education, Mark. So don't just hope for a fair claim settlement. Be certain and know exactly what you receive with an agreed value policy. American Collectors Insurance has been protecting enthusiasts since 1976. Give them a call today for your personal agreed value quote at 866-ACI-YEAH. That's 866-224-9324. Tell them your friend of Mark Green's at Cars Yeah. American Collectors Insurance, classic car insurance, designed by collectors for collectors, automotive enthusiasts just like you and me. They're the ones that insure my car. That's American Collectors Insurance. So, Chris, we are back. Now, this is a fun talk today because typically I'm dealing with people that are on the the far end of the automotive sector. You're really at the beginning. And and I've toured many operations and, and factories where they're building cars and so forth. And those giant rolls of aluminum that come in are always amazing to me that they end up being these beautiful cars and so forth. So take us back in time post soccer career and into a time you decided to get into a field like this. And then we'll talk more about Constellium because my understanding is this com- company dates back more than a century. Uh, actually, uh, I started off, um, as I say, 37 years ago, working on the shop floor uh, of a rolling mill in South Wales and uh, learned a lot about the product and the process from that perspective. And then obviously over the years is uh, aluminum light weighting came to the fore um, our product portfolio has really uh, reflected that. So if you look at where we are today in Muscle Shoals, we produce over a billion pounds of finished product, finished aluminum coils a year, of which about 20% uh, is dedicated to the automotive industry. Uh, the other facility in which I have responsibility for in Bowling Green is dedicated just to automotive uh, uh, coil processing. And it's a, a plant that's just five years old. Um, been producing commercial quality product for about three years, but 100,000 tons a year is our um, uh, capacity. And we produce uh, material that goes on doors, uh, car doors, hoods, uh, tailgates, both inner and outer quality. So whether the consumer sees the material when you buy a vehicle would be an outer or the inners, which is more of a support structure product. But extremely exciting uh, time to be uh, part of the industry and credit to the facility we have in Bowling Green, uh, whereby they've really developed um, a real place, if you will, at the table in terms of their capability to produce uh, world-class quality. And the productivity of the facility, again, has uh, increased exponentially over the last three years to uh, really compete very, very successfully with uh, other manufacturers in the business. Well, no doubt. I mean, huge facilities, and I love the fact that this is being produced in in the United States as well, of course. That means people are at work and doing jobs. Now, given that you've been in the industry for as long as you have, and then the company Constellium has gone back to a century or more, in the lifetime that you've had with this brand and with this product, how has it changed? Because I go back to when I was a kid and aluminum cans kind of came to be and people, oh, we were going to recycle. And I used to go around and collect aluminum cans and turn them in and make a few few pennies here mm-hmm. and there to buy some candy and so forth. But the industry's changed a lot. So how has it evolved? Well, actually, uh, some of the things you just mentioned that are still very much at the forefront of our objectives, recycling, namely being uh, the, the, the main one. Uh, at the facility here in Muscle Shoals, we have... Uh, the capability to recycle about 20 billion uh, UBCs or used beverage cans a year. Wow. And that is one of the foremost pillars on which the, the company is based. Um, and obviously, you know, the more that we're able to recycle, uh, the better it is not only from um, an environmental point of view, with the intrinsic qualities of the, the can never actually um, waver. And they have uh, infinite capability of uh, appearing back on the shelf six weeks after you throw them in the trash bin. Six weeks? Six weeks, yeah. That's, wow, uh, I had no that's, idea. Uh, mm-hmm. And obviously then from a, an automotive point of view, the more aluminum content that we see uh, appearing in, uh, in vehicles and platforms, uh, not only currently, in the last 10 years or so, when the growth that we expect around uh, electric vehicles, uh, we're looking to actually you know, recycle, set ourselves up to be able to uh, recycle and uh, utilize that benefit from, uh, from used vehicles as well as. 
You know, on vehicles for a long time, they're obviously made of steel and then aluminum started to come on to different panels and different parts. Are vehicles nowadays a majority of aluminum or are there still different components? We know there's some plastics, obviously, things like that for bumpers and so forth. But so Mm -hmm. much of the vehicles are recyclable today, which is really great. Yes, exactly. And, and I think you'll find, Mark, that it varies depending on, uh, on platform on which organization has really got uh, more of a, an aluminum intensive uh, portfolio, if you will, and how they develop going forward. I mean, the pluses in terms of the reduction in vehicle weight, as you just mentioned, um, and the corresponding benefits as far as fuel economy is concerned, are obviously at the forefront in terms of those initiatives. And as the electric vehicles, typically uh, the weight that they are, anything that aluminum can do to offer offset that weight with lighter closures and structural components, battery enclosures and so on, gives them the opportunity to extend the life of the battery as well. So uh, we're very interested in making sure that we stay lockstep with those developments going forward with a view to growing our footprint, if you will, in this, uh, in this area going, uh, as far as our portfolio is concerned. When you think about aluminum today, the use of aluminum, let's say in your facilities, how much comes from recycled aluminum and how, how much comes from raw material? Um, as far as um, packaging products are concerned, if you look at runaround uh, scrap that we have, which is basically as we trim the product at various uh, stages of the process, which we put back into the, the furnace, if you will, to melt the material, plus of what we actually garner from used beverage cans, as far as the packaging is concerned, we're about a mid-90s as far as recycled content is concerned. Wow. Uh, which is uh, obviously, uh, it would help if we had a few more initiatives st- uh, countrywide in terms of uh, either deposit systems or initiatives around promoting recycling. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are very few states that have the deposit system, which obviously we see a better return, if you will, in terms of making UBCs available. Uh, but that is one area, I think, um, countrywide that we have a big opportunity of uh, being able to improve upon if uh, more people would adopt that as an initiative. This is interesting to me because where I live, we recycle everything. We have multiple bins. Mm -hmm. They come and pick all this up. So there's still places in the country where they just don't do it? Correct. Wow. Yeah, unfortunately, that is the case. Yeah, unfortunately. And if you look at, um, you know, Europe, uh, if you will, especially the Scandinavian countries and look at the, their recycled percentages and obviously the corresponding benefits, as we've already just mentioned, I mean, it's a huge opportunity that we're missing out on in the U.S. Uh, if we could mimic and put into uh, some of the uh, into being some of the processes that have already been proved to be successful in the various countries, I think uh, it would be a huge benefit to the aluminum industry in, in, in the whole so how can listeners out there help move that forward? That's, can they talk to their lawmakers and say, hey, you need to pay attention to this? Absolutely. Yeah, that is one avenue for definite. And, uh, you know, local counties, countries, states, and so on and so forth, if you are uh, uh, setting the system up and getting people to buy into it and educating everybody, you know, from a sustainability point of view, of the intrinsic benefits of aluminum uh, over glass or a plastic, if you will, from a packaging point of view, um, that is all part of the process, right the way starting off from educating school children, right the way through to uh, being able to set up a process whereby it can easily be collected and segregated to the, uh, to the bigger benefit, if you will. Absolutely. How do you see the automotive, since this is cars, yeah, and I know you create things for a lot of other aluminum components, packaging, I think of my water bottle and so forth, where I don't have to use plastic water bottles. I can just refill that with filtered water uh, if I'm so picky, which I am. Uh, How do you see the automotive industry progressing into the future? And are the onset of so many EVs, are, are those vehicles using a lot more aluminum than cars in the past? Um, yeah, we see that as uh, one of the biggest catalysts, if you will, for growth going forward in terms of the use of uh, um, uh, aluminum. So as the uh, EV platforms continue to grow, obviously we're um, concentrating on making sure that we can uh, take advantage of, of the opportunities that arrive with uh, with increased demand. You'll see that in, um, in Europe, uh, they are probably a little bit further ahead. Uh, in terms of the opportunities and the platforms that already contain either a good quantity of aluminum or from an electrification point of view. Um, So from that perspective, uh, there's a a good story, if you will, on the horizon as most of the larger automotive companies uh, go down that path. For a guy who started on the rolling floor, as you said, versus rolling around on the floor and moved (laughs) your way up through the business and the company, what was it about this industry that kept you there and kept you so intrigued? 
Well, I was very fortunate in as much as uh, I've worked for global organizations pretty much all my life and uh, the opportunities that arise from a career uh, development perspective, but also um, giving you the opportunity to you know, make sideways moves into different areas to overall complement your education and you know, knowledge of the, of the process itself. Um, I've had a very supportive uh, family uh, that's allowed me to uh, move around in the four different countries that I've worked in, and uh, we've all benefited as a result. So, I mean, the, the fascination of the product and how it's evolved primarily around automotive in the last uh, 10 years or so has really been a big plus and to be part of that and then to manage a facility that uh, has really generated um, such a good uh, impact, if you will, not only from the portfolio of Constellium, but to be able to talk about uh, the fact that, you know, in Europe or around the world, if you will, sorry, um, we literally have a, a really good uh, footprint, growing footprint as far as the number of vehicles that we already have material on and that uh, we can offer pretty much uh, a sustainable quality in Europe or North America to be able to support future developments and future platforms that come down the pike. For a company that is as old as Constellium, give us a little quick history of the beginnings of how the company started. Where did it start? Uh, who was involved? Yeah, actually, it's not quite as old as you were crediting us with. We've only just actually gone through our 10-year anniversary. Okay. But really, it's been, but, but you're not completely wrong in what you say, in as much as really it's an amalgamation of, uh, I think it's four different aluminum companies that have been put together and uh, merged together over that period of time. So um, some of them have got a very, very rich history going a long, long way back. And now we've got the benefit of really a lot of people who were involved in those individual companies to start off with. And we've got the the best case scenario whereby we're able to learn from each other different practices and processes and knowledge sharing over that 10-year period has really put us into a, um, a very nice position to be able to compete globally with our product, primarily in Europe and North America, but also in, in Asia. And uh, it's a really psych uh, exciting time to be involved in a, in a company that's able to compete successfully with the increase in demand and the use that we see from aluminum, primarily in packaging and, and automotive, uh, but also, as we mentioned earlier, from a recycling point of view as well. That's uh, fantastic. Now, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your mentoring of other people a little bit later in our talk today, but I would love to learn a little bit more about who was perhaps a driving inspiration in your life. I'm guessing you were surrounded by a lot of great people who helped you, influenced you, or mentors for you, but is there anybody that you can think of, at least today, that stands out for you that was a real big help? Yeah, to be honest, I would say the common denominator through any of the jobs that I've had and really setting my um, objectives and uh, work ethic was my father, to be quite honest with you. And that's been, as I said, some of the things that he was teaching me when I was when I first starting out my first jobs. I've really stood the test of time and I, and I continue to remind myself in that regard. Uh, that said, I've also been really fortunate in each of the areas that I've worked at each of the countries I've worked in. There's always been someone that's been uh, available to me uh, and willing to, to coach and direct and advise and so on and so forth. So even though there's not one person from a business point of view, I've been extremely fortunate in finding those personalities in each area that I've worked over the last 35 years plus. Most definitely. Now, for a listener out there that's perhaps a young person that would love to work their way through an industry, a business, in a career like you've had, what are a couple of pieces of advice you would offer them? Yeah, I would say uh, never be frightened to ask questions. There's no stupid questions if you don't know the answers. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I was told at a very early age is never say, I know. Uh, you might have two people explaining the same process to you at two different times, but they'll, they'll use different phraseology. They'll rely on their own experience to get that story across. Always take the time to listen to those people around you, because if you don't, soon enough, you'll be surrounded by people who have nothing to say. <laughs> Now there's a quote I love. That's fantastic. We'll take a short break. We come back. I want to talk about a big challenge that you face and how you've overcome it and more importantly, what you've learned from it. So keep that thought in mind and we'll be right back. I've teamed up with AutoGeek because, well, they've been the leading source of auto detailing products, accessories for more than 20 years. Their Pinnacle Sovereign Paste Wax is specially formulated from Brazilian Carnuba Wax. It's easy to apply on any paint surface and provides that warm glow that we love, especially me on my vehicles. You're going to love it too. A favorite of car shows countrywide, Pinnacle Sovereign Paste Wax from AutoGeek wipes on easily, requires no drying time, is easy to remove, and provides up to 90 days of protection against 
against damaging environmental contaminants. This wax is designed to exceed the standards of the most discriminating enthusiasts and collectors. Go to autogeek.net to get yours for the best product selection on the internet today, along with their very skilled technical support. Autogeek.net. That's where I go for all my detailing needs. That's autogeek.net. I've discovered Linkage. It's a new quarterly publication and website that covers the automotive market, driving, restoring, collecting, and discovering your passion for motor vehicles. Linkage is about experiences, opinions, and values. Linkage is an actual informed, reasoned opinion based on firsthand experiences. A talented Linkage team covers the automotive world, the people who share your passion and mine, smart, considered, rational, and experienced opinions, ones you can learn from and grow. That includes our passion that drives auctions and the collector car market. So come with me and join us on this journey. And be sure to use the code CARSYEAH when you subscribe, and they'll give you $10 off. Boom! Linkage, geared for the automotive life. Subscribe today at LinkageMag.com. 20, 50, or 100 years from now, will there be a workforce to care for the collector vehicles we love? With auto shop programs disappearing across the country, it's a question we enthusiasts have to ask. That's why I support the RPM Foundation, which exists to ensure that the critical skills necessary to preserve and restore these vehicles aren't lost to time. One of the many ways RPM, which is short for Restoration Preservation and mentorship is accomplishing this goal is through workforce development initiatives. The RPM apprenticeship program enables the next generation of artisans to earn a living while they learn the craft of restoring and preserving these vehicles directly from industry professionals. The endangered skills program documents the process of masters training future craftspeople on a variety of critical skills in danger of being lost forever. For more information on how the RPM Foundation is driving the future of the collector vehicle skills trade, visit RPM Foundation today. They're one of the charities of choice here on Cars Yeah. So, Chris, let's talk about this. Uh, No doubt you've uh, been pushed up against the wall a few times, perhaps, in a way. And I'd love for you to share an experience that taught you a really valuable lesson, but was really, really challenging for you. So take us on a bit of a rough ride. Yeah, I would say um, more recently in the last five years or so, when I was, uh, um, or four years, sorry, when I joined Constellium, I was given the opportunity to run the Bowling Green facility. It was very much a case that it was uh, coming up from a you know, greenfield expansion, uh, but we had a lot of work to do with a, what was then a very inexperienced workforce, uh, yet we were trying to get our, our foot in the door, if you will, uh, with the Fords, BMWs, and so on, and Toyotas, and to build our portfolio. The challenge that we had uh, was really trying to uh, expedite that learning curve, commission what was new equipment, and generate the automotive mindset uh, with a workforce of which it was, it was completely foreign to at that time. And by automotive mindset, I mean understanding uh, the requirements of the automotive manufacturer in terms of quality of material and the need to have consistency through your production and supply chain process, uh, but also being able to be flexible enough to the demands uh, of the end customer. So it was a real education and um, in terms of how you actually do that literally from, from step one to get to the point where now, you know, three years of commercial quality material later uh, and we are producing um, world-class quality on a regular basis. We have our utilization and all our numbers and our key KPIs are world-class. Um, in a fairly short period of time in what is a very demanding product to produce in a demanding market. Um, That to me, that whole challenge of being able to turn that around to a profitable facility that really has a great future ahead of us really is uh, something that I'd like to, you know, looks good on your resume and hang your hat on, if you will, to be part of that. And credit to the team uh, that is in Bowling Green uh, to be able to uh, deliver that and sustain that improvement in a relatively short period of time. Absolutely. I think of Bowling Green, I think of Corvettes too. Exactly, just five miles down the road. Yeah, very, very cool. So if you look ahead to Constellium, let's just, we don't want to look too far ahead because what we've had to deal with the last couple of years, nobody anticipated <laughs> that. But when you look ahead, what are some bucket list items for the for the company? 
Yeah, the couple from, from my perspective, I would say uh, they're twofold. One is the development of people. I really do enjoy the coaching. I really do enjoy trying to help somebody else grow in their career uh, and learn from some of the mistakes, perhaps, that, the, and experiences that I've had over the 30, last 35, 37 years in the business. I, I take a lot of pride in doing that. And, you know, at the end of the day, whenever we move on to doing something else, you'd like to think that that same rigor uh, will form a foundation for further growth uh, for the business and for that person. So that's something that, uh, that I really take a lot of time every week in doing. Um, and then from uh, a business point of view, our biggest and number one priority worldwide within Constellium is obviously health and safety. Um, we've made amazing strides over the last uh, four or five years at both facilities in Bowling Green and here at Muscle Shoals in terms of recordable injuries. Recordable injuries are basically any injury of an employee that they have to receive medical attention by way of, of caring for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we are now world class. We've had three consecutive years where we've beat internal uh, requirements and targets from that point of view. But the ultimate goal, obviously, is to be able to send everybody home at the end of every day in the same condition that they come to work in in the morning, albeit a little bit more tired, uh, but injury free. <laughs> yeah. And uh, to be able to get to that for an annual basis, to be able to hit that metric of zero injuries is something that we strive for on a, on a daily basis. Wow. Well, it's a huge hats off to you and your team because uh, being in that environment where so many things can possibly happen, uh, that takes a lot of attention and a lot of commitment. And I want to go back to touching on the development of people. I'm going to jump ahead a couple of questions I typically ask, but we'll come back to your vehicle story. You're very committed to improving diversity in the workplace. I know that you've mentored and coached lots of people and especially in developing and empowering women leaders in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. My guest just yesterday comes from a company where she is a distributor and supplier for exhaust systems. And she's a woman working in, well, some would say a man's world. And she spoke a little bit of dealing with that. My wife had to deal that with that being an engineer in a man, typically a man's world back in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. So talk a little bit about the importance for you, and you mentioned it, of giving back to others, helping and mentoring others. Yeah, we actually have a corporate um, target this year whereby we have diversity targets that we have to hit uh, in the workforce. And as you quite rightly said, it's primarily um, a male-dominated industry. So anything we can do, I think, to, um, uh, to address that, to make sure that you have uh, diversity in, in every aspect of the, of the business is, is time well spent. And I've used over the last five or six years as a catalyst for discussion, if you will, is the um, Sheryl Sandberg book, um, Lean In. Yeah. Uh, Sheryl is uh, the uh, COO of Facebook, and she wrote this book about five or six years ago. And uh, I was challenged by a female colleague at that time to read it and to see what I could get out of it. And uh, then I gave it to my daughters who were both in the workforce, and I had some interesting conversations with them that I never thought I would have as their father, to be honest with you. Uh, and so I bought about, uh, I probably bought about a hundred of these books in the last five years. And um, I've asked uh, female colleagues, young engineers, regardless of where they are in the, in the, um, in the business, if you will, but they are, uh, obviously share a, a, an interest in progress in their careers. And I've asked them three questions, asked them to read the book within about a four week period, come back to me with what they were able to relate to in the story and some of the topics that were covered in the book. Uh, what else could we do as a facility, a local facility to help support them in their career development? And then also what could we as a company do uh, by way of supporting them in terms of the, their career going forward? Wonderful. And the CEO of the company, Jean-Marc Germain visited here um, when we were just launching that in Muscle Shoals, gave him the book. I gave my, my boss the book, uh, Peter Baston, who's the business unit president. And we managed to get quite a bit of um, uh, momentum in that regard. So now we have guest speakers coming in from um, local universities on a fairly regular basis uh, that uh, encouraging women to you know, assert themselves in the workplace and ways of doing that and being better accepted. Uh, and being able to, you know, stand shoulder to shoulder with their peers, if you will, in that regard. And it's been encouraging to see over the years how we've been able to uh, benefit not only as a company, but also to help develop um, the confidence and the uh, abilities for, for women to grow within the organization. So it's been a real fun process. And quite honestly, I think I've probably learned more than they have uh, in doing this. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it's been a very welcome surprise in that regard. Ah, spectacular. Let's talk about a special vehicle in your life, something that stood out for you, and maybe share a story about that ride. 
Yeah, I've got to be honest. Um, I've been very fortunate. We've owned a, a couple of Porsches in the last 10 years or so. Nice. And the first one we had was a Porsche Boxster. And we were living in um, in Atlanta, Georgia at the time, and uh, you know driving around some of the uh, you know the, we journeyed out to the Blue Ridge Mountains and had a weekend driving around uh, driving around there and the narrow curves and bends and so on it was really fun to be in a car like that and uh, enjoy the environment, but also to enjoy really uh, really driving the vehicle and pushing it. That was uh, that was really fun. I must be honest. I got a spot a soft spot for Porsches. That's for sure. Well, my listeners know that's my uh, mark of choice. I've loved Porsches my whole life. And I've got a good friend that uh, works there in Atlanta. He's a fellow Carsia alumni with you now, Ray Schaefer, who's the uh, manager at the Porsche Classic Center there. Uh, at the Porsche oh, cool. Center, yeah, in Atlanta. So, uh, wonderful facility. If you've never been there, check it out. Uh, you can go. You can drive cars on their track. They've got a great restaurant. They even have a cool little hotel uh, to stay at, which is wonderful. So, oh, very cool. Yeah, and the Porsche Boxster, awesome cars. I love the Cayman as well. Wonderful, fun, fun cars for sure. Very much so. so, I'm going to be your car psychologist today, Chris. I'm yeah. kind of guessing no one's ever asked you this. If you were <laughs> reincarnated or manifest as a vehicle, uh, what would you be and why? Okay, I've got a little bit of a split personality or hybrid, if you will, to, I love to it. Uh, okay. the automotive <laughs> phrase. I would say I'm probably somewhere between an F-150 um, in terms of uh, the way that I like to um, conduct, do my job mm-hmm. and uh, the work ethic that has been, as I mentioned earlier, inbred from, from my father from a very young age. Uh, but I also have the midlife crisis uh, period as well, where I, uh, as I said, I like the uh, the idea or the, and the opportunity to drive Porsche. So the uh, 911 GT3 would definitely oh. be something if I had the wherewithal to uh, to go in the other direction as well. So somewhere between the two probably is the the bookends of which I would operate. Now that's an interesting combination, but I kind of get it. Now I'll tell you where maybe you go with this is my next door neighbor has a Raptor, and if you've ever driven one of those, it doesn't drive like a GT3, of course, but that thing kicks tail i mean they are fast trucks and they're also very capable when the road gets a little rough or you get off of a pavement but uh the porsche 911 gt3 yeah that's uh <laughs> Ooh, yeah wonderful cars absolutely well yeah. i always like to ask my guests for a great book you mentioned one a lean in a wonderful book yep. that i think everybody especially men uh should read you'll learn a lot from it is there another book very you'd like to share with us yeah, the other one that I found beneficial and one also one that I've um, handed out to a lot of people that um, that I've been involved in coaching-wise is Emotional Intelligence 2.0 mm-hmm. by a guy called Travis Bradbury and essentially examines your capacity to be aware and control and express your emotions, but also how to handle imp- interpersonal relationships. Uh, it's not rocket science. It's a it's a toolbox, and uh, I think it's one of those books that you can most people can relate to, and circumstances that they've been in. And if you're really open-minded and you can analyze how you've handled or mishandled uh, interactions uh, on a, either personal basis or in business, uh, it's something that you can I find you can go back to and reference and still learn from uh, numerous times after having read it for the first time. Uh, I found it a real nice guide and a good reference um, over the last number of years. It's an awesome book. Yeah, for sure. I'll put uh, both of these books on Chris's show notes page on the Car Show website so you listeners can access them. And I make it really easy for you with a quick click to buy. There's also a great place on the site called Guest Recommended Books where there's over 2,000 books recommended by my inspiring automotive enthusiasts. So check them all out. You could fill a whole library. So I'm going to enable you to go on the ultimate drive. I'm going to open my big checkbook and buy you any car in the world. You can be with anybody, somebody living or deceased, and you can be driving anywhere. That's kind of a cool thought. So what's it look like for you, Chris? Okay, so you're going to be buying me an Aston Martin DB5. Okay. Um, and I, I I looked at what the average price was just out of interest. Yeah, so you're no cheap about day, point, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> they're about 1.4 million as we sit here today. So, yeah, if um, you can find one for that. <laughs> if you can find one, yeah. Um, and um, my drive would be, and I've been fortunate enough to do this a couple of times, is driving from Miami down to Key West. Okay. Um, really like that drive, yeah. really relaxing, lots of beautiful views and so on and so yeah. forth. And as a guest, I would uh, invite Mr. Elon Musk. Ah. Um, I would really like to get inside that guy's head. I've read a couple of authorized and unauthorized biographies. Um, Tesla was a, was a business that we've, uh, we've had involved in, in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just find the, the fact that he can uh, be so diverse with his businesses and obviously successful in those as well as 
and the learning process that's got him to where he is today. I think that would be a really good discussion. Well, no kidding. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. Yesterday's guest mentioned having Elon in the car with them as well. I'd like to be oh, sitting really? in the back seat listening uh, during that <laughs> talk as well. Yeah. He's one incredible person. Uh, that's for sure. Well, Chris, you're one incredible person. You've taken us on a wonderful drive today. And I can't thank you enough for sharing a little insider's view into the industry. When we car people think about where all the components for our vehicles come from. And I'd encourage listeners, if you've never been to a facility where they build cars, uh, go take a tour. I've done many in Europe. And I think one of the ones that made my eyes open up the most was uh, Mercedes Benz, where you actually get to see the beginning of those giant rolls that you guys supply Mm -hmm. punched out and made into body forms. And then the whole process throughout is absolutely phenomenal. So we appreciate you providing uh, high quality goods for our wonderful vehicles. Before I let you go, could you share some words of inspiration, a quote or a mantra? Yeah, I would say um, something that I learned uh, about 15 or 20 years ago in a seminar that I'd done that, uh, you know, as you go through life and hopefully continue to develop yourself and be the best version of yourself, um, I think even more important today is to be able to keep that work-life balance. And um, one quote that I was uh, like, I heard given during a presentation went something like this, for all the successes in public life, they never make up for the failures at home. And I think that instead of chasing, you know, bigger opportunities or sometimes the almighty dollar, you've got to remember the relationships and the people that depend on you and you go home to every evening. And I think that's something that um, sometimes can be easily forgotten. And I, and I try not to get in that uh, in that position, but it certainly uh, helped me make some decisions career wise over the years. Oh, I, I can't. Yes, absolutely. And I look back on, on my life, some of the things that I spent way too much time uh, in the office versus being at home with my children and my wife and with mm-hmm. family. Yeah, it's a very delicate balance. And there's a lot of great books out there that can help people with that balance so they can see that it can actually happen. Even if you're somebody like Chris and running a huge company with a lot of people he's responsible for, how can people learn more about Constellium? Yeah, if you can, uh, the people can access our web page on constellium.com. Uh, it's a really uh, good, uh, inf- informative way of learning about the company. And also in the areas that we're growing, where we're investing, the opportunities are out there. There are a lot of jobs uh, that are also still available, specifically here in Muscle Shoals. Uh, and to be part of that growth story is is really neat. I mean, I've thoroughly enjoyed the time that I've spent. You continue to enjoy it. And I think people... Um, will be pleasantly surprised at what the organization can offer, offer uh, both locally and internationally. Uh, and also, I'm on LinkedIn, so anybody that should have any additional questions that I can help with, uh, please uh, look me up on LinkedIn. I'll be only too glad to to respond. Well, there you go, listeners. An oppor- another opportunity here on Cars, yeah, uh, for a career change, something new, something exciting, and uh, a great adventure. So check them out. I want to do a shout out. Thank you to uh, Adrian at Buzzforia. She's brought me another great guest today. So thank you so much uh, for bringing Chris to the Cars yeah! listenership and audience. Chris, thanks for being so generous today with your time and expertise and for sharing your story with us. Wonderful. Until you and I talk again, my friend, I'll see you down the road. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.